All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Tokuhama, and I am a Senior Assistant Director of Admission here at Northwestern, and we are here for a virtual information session. Um, so just to make sure that all of you are here for the right event, um, I always ask, I typically do a, a little bit of a joke in class because I am used to folks kind of wandering into classrooms, and I always want to give them a graceful exit. Um, so just to make sure that you are here for the information session, that is why we are gathered. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here today. I know that it's tough between school and kind of hectic life and, and all of those things that are going on in the world right now. Uh, we really appreciate you spending the time with us and, and hopefully you will get some good information about Northwestern and uh, kind of leave feeling better about the process than when you you know when you first started. Um, really quickly, I did want to acknowledge that we know that for a lot of you, both students and parents, uh, things are a little bit um, chaotic in the world at the moment. Um, we have a lot of information, a lot of questions that are coming in um, about kind of the state of the fall for us, of how COVID has been impacting us, um, things like that. And so one of the things that we want to kind of do just at the outset is to acknowledge for, for first both uh, the time that you're taking to kind of um, spend with us, but also that we have a number of resources on campus. Um, online, uh, you can kind of check out what's being done if you have questions about those. We're not going to talk a lot about those in the information session today, but if you have specific questions, certainly feel free to head over to the website and check it out. There's a lot more information there. Um, but with that said, I wanted to do a little bit of a more formal introduction. Um, so I mentioned a little bit earlier that I am a Senior Assistant Director of Admission on campus. I oversee a territory that kind of spans parts of the uh, Chicago suburbs. I also have Kentucky, Indiana, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and Louisiana. So it's a pretty you know, eclectic mix. But if you're from one of those areas, please say hi in the chat. Um, it always makes me smile to see when you know we have students who are from one of those states. Um, and I'm a full-time staff member here on campus. So I'll be actually kind of tag teaming on today because as fascinating as I think I am, um, I, we know that you, you really don't want to hear from me. We actually have a, a current student representative, Candace, um, and she is super phenomenal and I'm super excited to present with her. So Candace, do a quick intro if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Chris. Hi there, everyone. My name is Candace LeBlanc and I'm actually a very recent graduate of Northwestern. Um, I graduated on the dual degree track with a Bachelor of Music and Voice Performance and Opera and a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing. Uh, during my time on campus, I served as a senior admissions counselor and a tour guide coordinator, uh, and I'm coming to you um, from Long Beach, California for my home right now. And one of my favorite things that I was a part of during my time at Northwestern was our acapella community. I was a part of a co-ed acapella group called the X Factors, and we got to perform every single quarter and also go on tour during winter break. I am super jealous. I didn't know you're from the LBC. I went to school in Southern California, so I would rather be there right now with the beach and all that sort of stuff. It's uh, I'm jealous. I'm very, very jealous. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for, for kind of joining us again. Um, and one of the things that we kind of wanted to start the, the, the presentation with is that, um, like Candace kind of mentioned, we have folks from all over the country, all over the world attending uh, Northwestern. And it's really exciting when we have a lot of folks on campus. Um, we firmly believe in this idea of diversity and, and wanting kind of different voices represented. So um, although this fall is probably going to look a little bit different for us and we're not all physically going to be in the same space necessarily, um, that same idea holds true, where what we want is for students to kind of come together from different parts of uh, the world different kind of socioeconomic backgrounds, different religious, different political backgrounds, all the different ways that you can think about diversity and identity um, and sort of stew together and, and challenge each other in productive ways um, to sort of help see the world in a new way. Um, and this is sort of one of our core values that we have that runs throughout all of our academics. And we think it's really important um, for students to be able to articulate a lot about who they are, but also be open to learning from others. Um, and it's always really exciting to sort of hear, you know, when we, when we have an audience where folks are from um, and kind of um, learn a little bit more about them that way. Um, when we're in a virtual format, it's a little bit tougher to do that. Um, but I did want to put it out there as something that we think is, is really, really important. Um, but sort of thinking about the classroom experience and, and kind of touching on that lightly a little bit earlier, um, we talk a little bit about academics first. And I know this is the thing that a lot of students are very interested in, in terms of kind of learning more about Northwestern as an institution. Um, and to kind of kick it off, we are a private liberal arts research university, and we can unpack each of those qualifiers. Um, we actually have six undergraduate schools where students will study. Um, and I think one of the things that's really exciting for a lot of our students is that they are um, not just 
multidisciplinary. They are not just folks who are studying two different things, um, but many of our students are actively interdisciplinary. They're thinking about how to combine different majors or areas of study or in, in interesting ways or finding the overlap between different areas of study. Um, but I think one of the most powerful ways that we can kind of help you understand this idea, this core idea of interdisciplinarity um, is to have a student perspective. And so I'm gonna actually turn it over to Candace in a little bit and, and have her talk about it from a student perspective, what it means to study at Northwestern. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I was a dual degree student, but I was able to take courses uh, both um, inside my major and outside of my major. So outside of creative writing in the College of Arts and Sciences, I also took courses in, eth um, in ethnic studies, religious studies, Slavic studies, um, pretty much you name it and I've tried it. And in the Beaton School of Music outside of voice performance, I've also taken courses in ethnomusicology conducting um, and other various different types of music classes. Um, but even outside of my two schools, I've been able to take courses across all of our six schools here at Northwestern. I took a podcasting course in the Middle School of Journalism, a film course in the School of Communication, a, an, apply, an applied mathematics course in our McCormick School of Engineering. And um, last spring, I actually took a course, one of our most popular courses in the School of Education and Social Policy, known as Building Loving and Lasting Relationships Marriage 101, which I can say was a life-changing experience, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself and talking about my five-year academic journey. Many of you are at the beginning of your college search, and some of you may know exactly what you want to study. I definitely fell into that category when I was looking at schools. I knew that I wanted to study both creative writing and opera, and I didn't want to have to sacrifice one of my passions as just a minor or an extracurricular. And with Northwestern being on the dual degree track, I was able to study both of my passions with the same amount of zeal. But some of you may not know what you want to study, and that's okay. Here at Northwestern, we like to call ourselves a place of discovery. So my friend Ben came to Northwestern his first year as a chemistry major. And after taking roughly two quarters of chemistry, my friend, my, my friend Ben realized that um, he didn't really like chemistry and he talked to his academic advisor and she recommended cognitive science, something that was still in the science field, but most definitely not chemistry. So Ben went on to take another two quarters of cog sci and he was halfway through his sophomore year and he realized he didn't really like cog sci. At this point, he was pretty certain he didn't like science at all. So my friend Ben went once again to his academic advisor and asked him or asked her, okay, how can you please help me? I don't know what I want to study. I'm not going to graduate on time. Please help me. And after having a pretty lengthy conversation with his academic advisor, Ben realized that his classes that he was most interested in weren't his science classes, but actually his language courses. So my friend Ben actually just graduated this past year as a German studies major on time. And I think that goes to tell you how amazing our faculty members and our faculty advisors are here at Northwestern. Here at Northwestern, we do have a six to one student to teacher ratio. So it lends itself to smaller class sizes. The smallest class I've had was a three person keyboard skills class at 8 a.m., a very nice intimate setting. And um, over 80% of courses at Northwestern have 20 students or fewer. But of the 2% of courses here at Northwestern that have over 100 students, um, those are typically your larger introduction style courses. So think intro to psychology, intro to economics. For any course that has even more than 40 students, the professor who teaches the normal lecture is required to have a separate discussion section. So that discussion section is hosted by a teacher's assistant, and you'll go from that larger lecture hall of 100 students to a smaller discussion section um, of anywhere between 8 to 15 students. For class that I mentioned before, Marriage 101, which is one of our more popular classes that had around 190 students in the lecture, but then I went to my discussion section that there was only 12 of us. And um, as I mentioned before, um, with my friend Ben, our um, faculty members are also work as faculty advisors. And from the moment you step foot on Northwestern's campus, you have a faculty advisor. And from every additional specialization that you add on, you get an additional faculty advisor. So I had both a creative writing and an opera faculty advisor. And these are the people who are going to help you choose your classes, figure out your major, and also navigate the quarter system as a whole, which Chris can go into more. Yeah, and then just to take a quick step back, you know, for those who might not be familiar with the quarter system, we essentially split up the calendar year into four parts, uh, hence the name quarter system. Um, we actually have three academic quarters, 
fall, winter, and spring. Um, and one of the differences between us and a semester system school is that we actually start a little bit later. Um, so our students typically start in September and get out in June. Uh, the nice thing about the quarter system, though, is that there's actually a break between each of the quarters. So you're not kind of at home over Thanksgiving studying for finals or things like that. You actually have a week-long break. And a lot of our students will use that break to do like an externship. They'll go off and do uh, like an alternative spring break. Um, it's really just time for them to kind of devote to what they like to do. Um, the major difference, though, between us and semester system schools is that we actually have students take more classes per year. Um, so students will take about four courses each academic term. And since we have three academic terms per year, they end up taking about 12 courses overall um, in their first year. And like Candace was talking about, there are some students who know exactly what they want to do coming in. They're like, I have figured it all out. I can't wait to take these classes. Um, that allows them to dive a little bit deeper a little bit sooner. Um, but there are also students, as Candace mentioned, who have no idea what they want to do, and that is totally fine. Um, what we found in the past is that having those classes gives students a chance to kind of sample different parts of the university and figure out what areas of study they might be interested in and then later on develop those into majors or minors or, or courses of study. Um, so it works for, for all kinds of students, um, but those are kind of the major differences between us and a semester system school. The one thing I would highlight though very quickly is that we actually, even though we have a summer quarter, uh, the summer quarter is not mandatory for our students, which is a little bit different between us and some other schools that are on the quarter system. Um, so it's kind of like your typical summer vacation or, or summer break. There is a summer session where you're able to take summer classes if you so choose, um, but that is not uh, something that required for all of our students. Um, but staying on that kind of top level, you know, kind of taking a huge step back, um, we are still a liberal arts school. So even though we're on the quarter system, our classes are organized much uh, along the lines of any other liberal arts university or college, meaning that about one third of your classes are going to be for your primary major, one third are going to be kind of what we call general education or distribution requirements, um, and then about one third are elective. Um, the exact balance will, will uh, be a little bit different depending on school and, and things like that, but roughly that's how it breaks out. That last third is sort of what allows a lot of our students to explore, to take a second major or two minors or study abroad and do an internship, do a co-op experience, kind of all the things that they've been looking to do in college, that flexibility comes in in that last piece of it. Um, and we find that it's really helpful for students to sort of be able to hone in on what they want to do and balance their workload as they see fit to kind of uh, meet their other goals or accomplish their other um, uh, interests and it's it's sort of a, a one third one third one third liberal arts model overall um, but the thing that i sort of want to impress upon students uh, you know when we're thinking about academics is that for us the opportunity to study at college should be hopefully an exciting one. Um, you know, we have a lot of current students who are doing some really amazing things. Um, but what we want for you as prospective students is to think really carefully about, you know, what are the kinds of things that you could study in college that you might not be able to yet? Or are there things that you got introduced to in high school that you really want to kind of dive in deeper, right? Um, a lot of times students come in and they're like, oh, you know, I'm really smart. I have had a lot of A's or, you know, I've had whatever. They, you know, like these high kind of benchmarks in terms of academic testing. Um, and we're like, that's really great. I'm really, really happy for you. Um, but we're looking for something a little bit more than that. The kinds of students who I think are most successful on campus are the ones who are driven by questions. Um, they encapsulate this idea that we call intellectual curiosity. Uh, and this is the part where us as a research university really comes into play. Uh, we want to see for you as a student, like, what is it about the world that you just don't know enough yet? And you're going to college to learn more, to develop skills, to sort of understand, to interact with people, to hash things out in discussion. Uh, that's the kind of spirit that we want at our core. And I think it's really, really great um, because we have a number of different academic programs. We have actually uh, over about 190 majors. Uh, and of course, is a study between minors and certificates, all these different combinations of things. Uh, and there's just so much out there. And if you talk to your parents, students, um, this is kind of the cliche, but it's like there are things that you can do in college that you can never study again in your life. You're never going to have the luxury necessarily of being able to dive deep into art history. Um, and it's really a thing where you are given the flexibility to explore those and still graduate on time. Um, we want to make sure that all of our students get out in four years if that is what they want to do. And so you, you uh, I, I would reassure students that they have the room to explore, um, but they're still going to be on track. Um, and I think one of the things that we sort of really want to iterate on as well is that, you know, for us, research is, is really core to who we are as a university, um, which is not to say that you as a student have to be involved in quote unquote research, meaning that 
you have to don a white lab coat and be hunched over a bench and mix chemicals, that that's not what you want to do. Um, but going back to this idea of inquiry, that's really sort of the heart of who we are. Uh, it's not just for professors and grad students. It's really a case for you, know, you as a student, as an undergraduate, to get involved in that, to get your hands dirty, to sort of figure out more about the world. We really want students to bridge theory and practice, to take what you're learning in a classroom and say, how does this apply to the world around me? Does this still hold true? Um, how do I help write the information that's going to be in the next generation of textbooks, right? It, it's not just amassing information and, and spitting it back out on a test, um, but it's thinking critically about the information that you are processing. How do you add to that body of knowledge? What kinds of questions haven't yet been asked that need to be answered? That's the orientation that we want for you as a student. Um, and I think there are a lot of opportunities for students to kind of explore this as an undergraduate. And that's, that's the part that I want to hit home. Um, we really have a strong undergraduate research culture on campus. Uh, one of my favorite labs on campus is something called the Knight Media Lab. They are an outfit that's actually a cross-pollination between uh, McCormick, our School of Engineering, and Medill our School of Journalism. Uh, it is kind of folks thinking about how to use digital tools to tell journalistic stories in a new way. So if you are familiar with things like VR, virtual reality, or augmented reality, um, you're thinking about how to use those kinds of tools to tell stories. So as opposed to watching a video um, or, or kind of a satellite feed, what does it mean to be put in a VR simulation um, where you're on the streets of the aftermath of a hurricane, um, or you are kind of uh, with folks who are protesting, right? You sort of understand a story in a different way because of that. Um, alternatively, they're thinking about how to use apps to sort of geolocate stories that are going on locally in your area. So if you just happen to be in an area, what's happening in the world around you? How can you connect through to that through your mobile phone um, and things like that? So it's a really exciting space where folks are just thinking about kind of these ideas and iterating on them um, and kind of pushing them up against the wall and seeing what works and breaking things and trying things out. Um, it's a really vibrant space. There's always a lot of great chatter that's happening on in there. Um, but to kind of put a little bit of a finer point on it and, and talk a little bit about it from the student perspective, I'm actually going to turn it over to Candace because there's a lot of great stuff that's happening with things like our Office of Undergraduate Research. Um, and I'm sure Candace has stories about either herself or friends that have done research at the undergraduate level that you can share. So take it away, Candace. Most definitely. The first thing I like to mention with undergraduate research here at Northwestern is that Northwestern allocates three and a half million dollars every single year for only undergraduate research. So that's not for faculty members, that's not for PhD candidates, There's it's just for us undergrads. And there's lots of different ways that that can take shape and form. Uh, kind of similar to what Chris mentioned, when I first came to Northwestern, I thought that um, academic research was just people in white lab coats, and that most definitely is the kind of research that happens every single day. My friend CJ was a biology major in the pre-med track, and he worked in the skin tissue lab for all of his four years here at Northwestern. I personally don't have the science background or experience to tell you exactly what he did, but he just tells me that he's making the world a better place. But for me as a heavily humanities-based major, I never thought I would partake in research during my time here at Northwestern. Now, having just graduated, I think I've done three separate research projects. And the first one I did happen my very first year here at Northwestern. I was taking a sociology course with Professor Patilla, who I loved, and one day I went up to her after class and asked her how I could learn more about what she was doing outside of the classroom. And Professor Patilla told me about a research project she had going on in downtown Chicago, and she also told me that if I helped her out on it, I could get paid. So I said, sign me up immediately. And I got to work with Dr. Patilla for six months in downtown Chicago, analyzing the positive benefits of living in a Black community in Chicago. And what was great about that outside of, yes, getting paid and being able to go to downtown Chicago a bunch was that I was able to foster a strong relationship with that faculty member, so much so that I graduated this past June, five years after I first met her, and she was one of the first people to text me congratulations on graduation day. And in addition to that sociology research I've done, um, since then I've done research in the uh, creative writing department, um, writing copy for books for uh, people who um, learned how to read later in life in their 30s or so. And um, this past year, I finished my um, voice degree with honors. I'm doing a research project. I'm creating a multimedia exploration of the Black woman experience through um, a combination of Black artwork, film, and song. Uh, and those are just a few examples of what the kind of research that happens here at Northwestern. One of my favorite research opportunities is the Circumnavigators Grant that's given to one rising senior every single year. And they're given the opportunity to study one subject across the world. And there's only two rules behind it. One, you must travel to at least five separate countries. And um, secondly, they must be on at least three separate continents. And this is all paid for on Northwestern's dime, which kind of just sounds like a free vacation to me. But I'm fortunate to know um, two of the past recipients during my um, five years here. 
My friend Hannah, um, who was a social policy and music education dual degree student, uh, traveled from um, London to Kenya to Greece to India to New Zealand around the world in literally 80 days, um, studying how music education looks across the world and how uh, gender is influenced by that. And my friend Chris, who is a religious, a religious studies and music double major, uh, studied how Baha'i music looks across the world last year. And he's now um, transforming the research he started in that um, circumnavigators grant into now where he's going to be going um, to India with a Fulbright. And students are able to go internationally, yes, through research, but also through more traditional ways. Around 40% of students at Northwestern uh, pursue a traditional study abroad experience. Actually, personally, this past fall, I just studied abroad in Milan, Italy in the music program. And what's great about studying abroad in Northwestern is that all the financial aid goes abroad with you. In addition, we have academic advisors across all the disciplines. So if whether or not you are a music major, an engineer, a neuroscience major, a French major, you have that opportunity to study abroad and make sure that your credits count once you come back. So studying abroad shouldn't be a question of if you can afford it or if you can graduate on time, but just truly a question of where do you want to go. In fact, my friend Jane, who graduated last year um, as a journalism and music dual degree student, studied abroad during her spring quarter of her junior year. That's just what fit her, her schedule the best at the Globe Theater in London as a marketing intern. And students are able to pursue internships, yes, internationally, but also a little bit closer to home. In fact, there's a lot of different ways how um, internship experiences are built into Northwestern's curriculum. One of the most popular ways for that is the Chicago Field Studies Program and our College of Arts and Sciences. Students are able to have an internship in the greater Chicago area and also get academic credit for it, which is great. And there's similar programs in the um, School of Education and Social Policy, the practicum program, as well as in our Medill School of Journalism, the journalism residency. Um, students can go as close as the Chicago Tribune or as far as South Africa in order to pursue an internship. And most of these internship opportunities are brought to us by Northwestern Career Advancement. If we were in our visitor center right now, there'd be a lovely slide of all the different companies where um, Northwestern students have interned. But what's great about NCA is that um, they'll give you all different types of services, whether it's um, helping you um, find business casual attire for an interview, or if you're like me during my junior year, I had three different roommates and I had a um, online interview at 8 a.m. They gave me a nice shiny room that I could have my interview in and not wake up all my roommates. And what's great about NCA is that they'll work with Northwestern undergrads, uh, undergraduates even once they join our alumni connection, which I guess now I can say I'm a part of, and Chris can talk about that alumni network even more. I feel like we should like flip it to you to talk about alums sometimes because you're like, now you're an alum, you can actually speak to that from, from that perspective. But um, this is actually a great example where I think one of the strengths of Northwestern really is our young alums. I mean, we have a fantastic worldwide um, alumni network and, and that presents a lot of uh, benefits for us. But I think the kind of exciting thing is that a lot of our young alums are very connected to the life of the university. So um, they are folks who are often coming back for things like mentorship meetups. They are folks who are helping uh, students figure out what do I do with a degree in X, Y, and Z major. Um, they come back, you know, not just for homecoming and things like that, but they're really a part of the life of the school. And I think um, what that suggests to me is that those folks have had a really meaningful time at Northwestern, right? Uh, um, my thought is that they wouldn't really give back to the school in that way if they didn't feel some sort of connection to it. And so um, it's really a case where I think our, our young alums are, are, are a fantastic source of strength. And as, as Candace was talking about, I think, you know, there's this continuum that we've been talking about in terms of uh, kind of starting your journey at Northwestern and figuring out your major and then going through your classes and uh, studying abroad perhaps, or doing a uh, research opportunity or internship and then kind of emerging the other end um, as an alum. And so that's really kind of our goal is to help you sort of envision your trajectory uh, throughout the Northwestern experience in terms of those four years. Uh, it's not just for us about getting in, although a lot of times students are like, oh, I got into, you know, this school and now I've made it. Um, we really think about success in terms of you kind of making it through and emerging the other end. Um, and like Candace, I mean, this is her first year out of college of like, you know, like you can look back and say like, okay, I feel like Northwestern really prepared me well for, for life outside as much as anything can, right? As, you know, a 20-year-old, a like how does life look? Everything is new in, in some ways. But uh, this is sort of what our hope is for you in many ways is that it's not just about us being, you know, a highly ranked school or things like that. It's really about what we can do for you as an institution to help you actualize and, and, and uh, kind of um, achieve your goals. Um, 
But I think the thing about our alums as well is that, you know, we certainly have a lot of high profile ones. We certainly get uh, Stephen Colbert name checked all the time, Meghan Markle now more than ever, uh, <laughs> among other things. Um, but the alumni uh, network as a whole is a really great resource for a lot of us. So we talked a little bit about internships, for example, and a lot of our students will secure internships through the networking that they do through the internship, uh, uh, excuse me, through the alumni network. Uh, they'll kind of reach out through uh, the uh, alumni office and sort of figure out if I'm going back home for the summer, what are things that I can do. We have a lot of alums who are still in downtown Chicago. So if you're looking for an internship there, a lot of times um, you're able to secure something that way. So it's a really great benefit for a lot of our students to kind of take advantage of. Um, and it is something that is definitely worldwide. And it, you know, it's one of the things where I've learned not to wear anything with a Northwestern logo on it uh, when I'm like out in public. Uh, last year, when I was traveling in the fall, I made the mistake of wearing a Northwestern baseball cap because I was like, just like tired from traveling. And like, sure enough, some random alum came up to me in the middle of the airport and was like, hey, uh, did you go to Northwestern? And I was like, ah, no, not I didn't. And they're like, oh, you know, and they started this whole conversation with me about their like time about it. Um, and all this sort of stuff. And I, I love that. Like, I love that folks like are so connected to the school that they're just going to talk to a stranger about <laughs> their Northwestern experience. And it was a really great thing. Uh, so I think it's one of the things where you find like people all across the world who just love their, their time at Northwestern and more than happy to share stories about it with you. And I think that says something about their undergraduate experience. Um, but with that said, we're going to kind of transition a little bit uh, because we know that being a student at Northwestern isn't just studying all the time, or at least I hope it isn't. Uh, it's also about being a, a part of our larger community and sort of living at Northwestern and interacting with our student body. Um, and this is the part of the presentation that I'm going to hand it over to Candace for a little bit to drive because she has firsthand experience. As I alluded to before, I actually didn't go to Northwestern as an undergrad. Um, so you can hear it straight from a person who is just there about what it's like to be a part of our community. Uh, so Candace, if you wouldn't mind, take it away. Thanks, Chris. I think I've spent a lot of time talking about why I decided to apply to Northwestern, but I think what is important, if not more important, is talking about why I decided to stay at Northwestern. And for me, that's definitely because of the people. Um, there's all the people that I've mentioned, just even in this information session, are friends that I talk to on a daily basis. They're not just, you know, names that I've picked up. Um, they're people who are near and dear to my heart. And I know I've always heard of horror stories when I was applying to schools that you would hear horror stories of people ripping out pages in the library during finals week or as a creative writing and um, um, voice major, how those can be very competitive fields. I've never felt anything but support and camaraderie from my peers. And I think that starts from the very moment you step foot here on campus. And part of that is through our Wildcat Welcome, which is our first year in transfer orientation. The groups of students are uh, grouped up in pairs that are in groups of eight to 15 students. And they're led around by a peer advisor who's a Northwestern undergraduate just a few years older than them. And all these students are united by some commonality. So what, in my case, I was paired with a bunch of um, dual degree students, or if you're in the College of Arts and Sciences, all the people in your peer advising group are also in your first year seminar. And your peer advisor shows you around campus and leads you around various different Northwestern traditions. So whether that's marching through our Weber Arch and stopping in Deering Meadow and hearing a speech from our president, Morty Shapiro, or running across the football game for our first home game, uh, my incoming class, the Wildcat Welcome of 2015, actually set the record for running across the football field for the fastest amount of time. I've not checked to see if anyone's beaten that time, but at that moment in 2015, we were the best, and I like to hold on to that. And from there, once you've gone through Wildcat Welcome, there's also the physical place that you live on campus. Uh, we have tons of different videos online about our residential services and housing here on campus, but it's worth mentioning that we have a two-year on-campus living requirement. And... Um, pretty much anything that you could need in a residential building, whether it's a gym, a dining hall, a study space, a practice room. Uh, there are tons of different facilities inside the different residential buildings. And um, I've had a great experience. I lived in Willard Residential Hall my first year and my residential assistant, our RA, would give us um, thirsty Thursdays. We would have free coffee and tea every Thursday or midnight munchies where we get free snacks um, at the end of the night, which if you know anything about college students, if you put free in front of anything, we'll be more than happy to accept it. And in addition to housing, we also have lots of different significant spaces here on campus for students to explore parts of their identity that they may or may not have been able to explore during their time in high school. So these places include the Shield Catholic Center and the Black House, the Multicultural Center. These are just spaces for students to, um, to explore um, other parts of their identity. And in addition to that, we also have over 500 student organizations, which is a lot. 
These range from the ukulele club that plays on the Lakeville on slightly warmer days or happiness club during finals week when the libraries are open 24 seven, they will literally throw candy at students as they're studying. And if that doesn't make you smile, I think it's probably a sign that you should take a break from studying. But if you look across this wide array of um, student organizations that you think to yourself, wow, there's something I really wanna do or there's something that I did in high school that's not represented. It's very easy to start your own student organization. All you need are four friends and a faculty advisor and boom, you got a new student group. In fact, my first year, five of my friends who were all voice majors wanted to start their own acapella group, even though we had roughly 12 on campus at the time, because they not only wanted to sing pop music, but they also wanted to sing church hymns. So my five friends got together. Our choir teacher is now their faculty advisor, and they're now a recognized student organization and acapella group known as Tempo Tantrum. And now this was back in 2015 when they first started as a motley group of five. Now in 2020, there are a prospering acapella group of over 15 members. And I think that just goes to show that if you're interested in something here at Northwest, you're going to find something, someone who's also interested in the same quirky, kooky things that you are. And in addition to the acapella community that I was a part of, one of my favorite um, student organizations that I was a part of on campus is the Posse Foundation, which is a leader of merit based scholarship. And I served as a um, posse peer mentor for incoming posse scholars. And one of my favorite parts of that job is that I got to show incoming students the aspects of Evanston and Chicago, which also make Northwestern feel like home. I know I'm out here in Long Beach, California. Chris said that he was <laughs> jealous of me, but I'm kind of missing Evanston right now. Chris, you can talk more about the Evanston Chicago community. I was like, you're not missing the 90 degree heat that's going on right now. So <laughs> you are, you're probably better off over there in Long Beach. Um, but to speak to kind of Candace's to point, uh, we are a school that is kind of best thought of it as expanding concentric circles. So we talked about sort of your peer advisor uh, community and sort of like a really small home base when you first land on campus. There's certainly also your residence hall, which is your physical living space and the campus at large is kind of another area for you as well. Um, but we also are part of the city of Evanston. And for those of you who might not be familiar with the area, uh, we are a kind of suburban college town setting. We're about 12 miles to the north of downtown Chicago. And so uh, we're about uh, maybe a 10 minute walk from downtown Evanston where there's a lot of coffee shops um, and uh, kind of bakeries and, and student hangout spaces and things like that. It's really fun uh, just to kind of walk around the area. A Target opened up a few years ago, which I just laugh at because I'm like, if you have your parents' credit card and you write a Target, that is like the best place to be in the world. Um, and it's just a really cool kind of like low a low key kind of hangout spot for a lot of our students. Um, but I will say that a lot of our students will get off campus and into the Evanston area. Um, one of the things that I'm most sad about that we're not actually physically on campus right now um, is that we have a place called Andy's Frozen Custard um, and it is fantastic. And they have a discount uh, for Northwestern students and staff. So it's very, very dangerous to be there in the summer months when you can always stop by for free, like not free, I was gonna say free, uh, for cheaper frozen custard, it is fantastic. Um, but the reason that a lot of our students actually come to Northwestern is not just because of our environment in Evanston, but we sort of have the best of both worlds being very close to downtown Chicago. We actually have an elevated rail and the L that runs on the west side of campus. And it takes about maybe 30 to 45 minutes, depending on traffic, to get into downtown uh, Chicago. And so a lot of our students will head out there um, on the weekends or after school or things like that for anything from internships to cultural events. Um, typically in a normal year, there's a lot of stuff happening over the summer where there's food festivals, outdoor concerts. Um, one of my favorite things in the past years um, has been the Chicago Phil has kind of performed these outdoor concerts of all kinds. So sometimes they're movie music scores, sometimes it's classical music, um, and you can kind of bring your own picnic food and just hang out. Um, obviously, that's not happening at the current moment, but um, the idea that you can just kind of pick up and go and do all these sorts of things of head to a concert or to a theater or an improv show, uh, it's just kind of exciting. Um, I was actually I spent a lot of my life in Los Angeles, and so I was very used to the idea of being able to access those kinds of things. Um, and so the kind of hybrid of, of being able to, to live kind of in a smaller, kind of more laid back um, suburban setting, but access, still have access to the things in Chicago would be very appealing to my 17 year old self. Um, but Chicago is actually a really great resource for us as well in terms of, as I mentioned before, uh, things like internships. We also have a program called the Chicago Field Studies, um, where we send students to do kind of field work in the Chicago area. So if you're interested in doing things with uh, sociology, with economics, of sort of uh, thinking about kind of art, uh, we have a great partnership with the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, you're able to actually use the city as a resource in that way in terms of academics as well. Um, so it's really a great benefit for us. And I have to say, I, I'm a huge food person. I like to eat all the time. That's kind of all I've been doing the past 
few months. Um, and so Chicago has been a, a really great city for that as well. Um, one of my favorite spots sort of in the Rogers Park area, which is a little bit south of where we are, maybe about 15 minutes south of the campus. Um, there's actually this place called XO Marshmallow Cafe. Um, one of the things that I love is that you can actually make your own s'mores. Um, they have this little blowtorch that they set up and you roast your own marshmallows and they actually make all of their marshmallows from scratch. Um, and so it's this really kind of just fun off the wall kind of thing that you can do. And it's not something that you can do at every place around the country. Um, so one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to wrap up with is, is you know, if you're looking for that sort of uh, that balance in terms of uh, kind of living in a suburban area but want access to a major metropolitan city, we might be a place to check out. Most of our students, I would say 99% of our students, I think, if not all of our students, live on the Evanston campus, though. We don't have folks, generally speaking, who commute in or live in Chicago and come into Evanston. We really have a residential feel to our campus. And so a lot of our students are either on campus itself um, or living in the immediate proximity around campus. And then we'll venture into Chicago via lift or skateboard or train as you know might be appropriate to just kind of sample those things out. Um, but really, really exciting stuff. And if you want some more information, certainly check out um, a lot of our virtual tours. We actually just did a food review of the Evanston area. Um, Hillary, who is in the chat, my colleague, uh, kindly put together a team of current students to rate and review food uh, from different restaurants in Evanston. And I'm super jealous that the students got to eat food because, um, again, that's all I do. Um, and they had a really great time. So if you're looking for that kind of information, know that that is on our website and our YouTube as well. Um, but with that said, we're going to kind of round the corner and kind of wrap up with a little bit of a talk about admission and financial aid. Um, and this is really why I am here uh, as, as an admission representative. Uh, and so the thing that I want to kind of share with you um, before we move on to questions and answers is that um, we have a little bit of kind of top level information about the school in terms of admission information. A lot more detail is on our website, though. So please don't feel like you need to write all of this down or, or memorize it. Um, it's available through other sources, and it's on our website. So feel free to reference that. Um, but really quick, we are a school that kind of practices what's called holistic admission. So we take into account many different parts of your application, uh, not just grades and uh, transcripts, um, but also things like letters of recommendation. We read personal statements or essays. Um, the big announcement this year is that we actually uh, moved to be test optional for the 2020-2021 cycle. Um, and I think Hillary might drop a link in the chat about that um, in terms of what it means for students. We actually set up a special FAQ if you're curious, because I know it is just the wild, wild west right now with every school kind of declaring test optional and students are like, what does that mean? Um, and so know that we have some resources for you if you uh, need clarification on that. Um, and that is on our website as well. Um, but we are a holistic review process. And, and the thing that I want to stress with our review is that what we're, we're really looking for with students is trying to understand not just how impressive you are or smart you are or like how awesome you are. I mean, yes, all those things are true, um, but the kinds of students who I think are most successful so generally speaking, in our admission process are the students who really help us understand how Northwestern can help them get from where they are now as a 17, 18 year old high school senior, you know, you're like, this is where you are in life. How does Northwestern get you from there to where you want to go four years from now, five years from now? Uh, and this kind of echoes what we talked about really early on at the start of the presentation. This is how we see Northwestern um, as a place of transformation for you, right? And so our job as admission folks is to say, how can we help you do that? What are the things that we offer, the resources, the lab? the professors, um, you know, that will help you get to where you want to go. And it's not just about getting a job or getting, uh, you know, uh, to grad school. Those things are important and they will happen for many students um, if that's what you want to do. But we think, you know, beyond that and we're saying, okay, what, how can we enrich your, your life as, as part of being a Northwestern undergraduate? Um, so that's really kind of uh, the heart of what we're looking for on things like our Why Northwestern, um, or we're trying to understand through the application as a whole. As a really quick rundown, um, we do have two applications. Uh, we have early decision, which is a binding commitment. That is going to be due on November 1st for students. Um, and so if you are thinking about doing that, certainly, especially this year where things are a little bit more chaotic, a lot of times students aren't necessarily meeting regularly with their counselors. Um, you know, Start that process earlier because it might take a little bit longer to get things like letters of recommendation, to work with your school, to get transcripts, all that sort of stuff. Um, what I will say as well, especially in this year, is if you are having particular issues or things are coming up where you're like, my school just is not printing transcripts for whatever reason. Uh, we are well aware that a lot of schools, districts, a lot of schools uh, in particular are in flux. Um, so please just let us know about those things and we'll do the best that we can to work with you. Um, but we'd rather much, I'd much rather have you kind of give us a heads up about some of the potential problems that might come down the road um, and see what we can do to resolve those than just kind of have you turn in things late and, and us not know about them. Um, so November 1st is going to be the deadline for early decision. We also have a regular decision uh, deadline and that is going to be an early 
early January. Uh, we are actually in talks right now about, I think we are, uh, believe are going to possibly extend that to January 3rd, um, given where January 2nd falls. January 2nd is going to fall on a Sunday this year, so I think we're going to uh, default to the 3rd, but don't quote me on that just yet. Um, we will publish that on our website uh, when that actually gets confirmed. Um, and so the thing to kind of look out for with that is, you know, kind of just mark it on your calendar. It is a pretty quick turnaround, um, but certainly if you have more questions about what it means to apply versus uh, ED, early decision versus regular decision, we actually have a page on our website that helps explain that as well, um, or give us a call. Um, we're happy to have that conversation with folks a lot of times about whether ED or RD is most appropriate for you. Um, but the last thing that I want to kind of touch on very quickly before we wrap up um, is a little bit about financial aid. Um, we are a school that is very, very lucky in terms of uh, us having a fairly robust financial aid budget. Um, this past year, we had about $190 million that we were able to give out in financial aid. Um, and what I should mention is that we are a school that uh, is unique need blind in our admission process, meaning that if you apply for financial aid, we do not consider that as part of your financial aid um, or excuse me, as part of your admission process for uh, domestic students. For international students, we are need aware. So that's just one thing to be kind of uh, cognizant of. But if you are a domestic student, a US citizen, uh, you do not need to worry about that. I would always encourage students if they are even thinking about applying for financial aid uh, to talk with their parents. And there is a little bit of a cost associated with that in terms of things like the CSS profile um, to get that to us. But I would rather have them apply for financial aid and, and they could get some free money from us, essentially. Um, in terms of financial aid for us, all of our financial aid is need-based. We do not have many mar merit-based scholarships. There are some floating around from various organizations that are affiliated with uh, Northwestern um, or various offices on campus. So that, you know, you certainly feel free to, to seek those out. Um, but from us in the Office of Admission and Financial Aid, we give them based on need. Um, so basically what we do is we take things like the FAFSA and the CSS profile. We calculate something that's called the EFC, or estimated family contribution. The difference between the EFC and the total cost of attendance, which is tuition plus room and board, uh, projected travel expenses, or kind of uh, things this year have been like with laptop setup fees and things like that. Um, we kind of figure out what the difference is between the total cost of attendance and your EFC, and that would be your financial aid package. Uh, the thing that I wanna highlight is that we meet 100% of demonstrated need, so we do not have what's called gapping here on campus, meaning that um, we kind of fund you all the way up to what we say that um, your family financial aid should be, and that is through a no loan policy. So all of our financial aid is through things like university uh, uh, grant or work study if you qualify for that, um, but we do not include loans as part of that financial aid package. That doesn't mean that you as a student or a family, um, you're not prohibited from taking outside loans to meet the EFC, um, but from us, we are giving you essentially money that you do not need to pay back. Um, if you have specific questions about financial aid, I'm going to direct you to our colleagues at the undergraduate aid office. Uh, we know a lot about kind of basic financial aid information. We've gotten a lot of questions over the years, um, but especially this year, we have a lot of questions from students about very particular family circumstances, about asset allocation, about uh, kind of financial plans or retirement plans. Uh, it, it just, it goes on and on. Um, those are the questions that I will direct to our colleagues in financial aid because they can get very specific and I don't want to give you wrong information. Um, but certainly if you need help getting in contact with the financial aid office, reach out to us and we're happy to be the bridge to help you kind of get the information that you're looking for. Um, if you are just starting the process, so if you are a rising senior at this point, what I would strongly recommend to you is to take a look at something called an EFC calculator. So every school that receives federal financial funding is required to, on their website, have uh, a link to an EFC calculator. Um, you can look at the College Board, they have a great one, or you can use a tuition estimator like My Intuition. Um, basically, the idea here is that you want to get a ballpark of what it might cost to attend Northwestern. A lot of times we have students who um, grew up and they're like, I really want to go North to Northwestern since the time that I was two. Um, I'm super, super excited and I apply. Um, and my worst fear is that you get accepted and it, you know, kind of everything happens. And then in April, you have to sit down with your family um, and have the hard conversation at that point about whether you can afford it or not. Um, and I think it's very, very tough, right? And so what I tell students often is, you know, not to say that you shouldn't apply to Northwestern, you know, uh, because of the cost or anything like that, but really have a sense going in of what you can expect to pay. What is your budget or what is your family's budget more accurately for college? Um, you know, if you get accepted to Northwestern, will you have to get an outside scholarship to make that work? What is that going to look like? I know that discussion can be awkward sometimes for families because you're bringing up finances for sometimes, you know, sometimes the first time uh, ever in a, in a family dynamic. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to have that discussion sooner um, rather than later. So at least you sort of have expectations about what that will look like. Um, and because we are need-based, the number that you get from an EFC calculator, provided your family circumstances don't change much, which again, 
caveat, you know, we know that a lot of things are in flux. Um, if your family circumstances don't change much, the number that you get from the EFC calculator is pretty accurate. Um, so you can kind of at least get within a few thousand dollars of what you might expect to pay at Northwestern if you put the uh, correct information in. So again, if you have specific questions about that, contact finan financial aid. They're happy to have those conversations, even with prospective students. Um, but with that said, I am going to kind of uh, shift gears a little bit. We have about maybe 10 minutes left. Um, and so we're going to kind of open up the floor to questions. So I would say at this time, um, and Hillary might get upset at me, but uh, you know, feel free to kind of drop them in chat in terms of questions that you might have. Um, uh, and, and Hillary will kind of sort through. Basically, um, Hillary is helping us to kind of filter through some of the questions and, and feed some of those uh, to us. And so basically what I'm going to kind of do is look through uh, some of the questions that she's posted and probably uh, kind of ask them, both ask the question um, and then direct it either to um, to Candace or myself. Um, but in the meantime, as we are filtering through those, please feel free to start kind of dropping questions in chat and we'll get to them um, as soon as we can. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting that came up was kind of uh, a little bit earlier, someone had asked this question, um, and I'm going to direct this to Candace. Um, you know, you talked a little bit uh, about sort of being a creative writing major and opera performance and sort of the collaborative versus um, competitive environment. Um, for you as a student, you know, kind of speaking from that perspective, um, you know, one of the things that we often hear is that students are very kind of scared about uh, going into an academically rigorous environment and people are like rushing to check out books or they're like, you know, there's a curve and only a certain number of students get A's. Um, would you mind kind of diving a little bit more into sort of how Northwestern students tend to be collaborative? Like what kinds of ways do they engage with each other? What do they do to support each other through the academic process? Things like that. Definitely. I think that's totally a just concern. I think a, a good way of how Northwestern combats any sense of competitiveness is through peer tutoring. So for a lot of the courses that Northwestern knows that students will struggle in, like um, the like Math 220, which is a, um, similar to kind of intro to calculus, um, they offer peer tutoring for students that have either taken the course specifically at Northwestern or have placed out of the course at Northwestern, and they're able to tutor other students. And so I think that's a great way that students, when they're first coming into Northwestern, they're being able to see other students that are excelling, that are willing to share their knowledge. So for me, as a creative writing and opera performance major, I actually was a peer tutor um, for Math 220 uh, as just a way to give back to the knowledge that I had. Um, but outside of peer tutoring, mo for most classes, students will have um, group study guides. So whether that is having a shared Google spreadsheet that people will share, they will um, share their notes in it. Um, if there's an exam um, in our main library, there are a bunch of different collaboration rooms um, where students can sign up and study. And that's not just something that I mentioned, oh, you can sign up and study. I've spent many and many an hour in main collaboration rooms studying for musicology exams, studying for Slavic studies exams, um, and pr pr um, uh, particularly for the performing arts, I think a way that Northwestern does a really good job of um, combating any sense of competitiveness is that um, we really, we take all of our classes together. And with that, you're able to see people growing and changing over time. And um, we serve as both um, critics, but also being um, the first people to congratulate people. So for me, I remember when I got my first uh, main stage role at Northwestern, the same people who were applying for the same role that I did were the first people to also send me congratulation texts. Uh, and I think that's very emblematic and not uncommon at Northwestern. I think that's a really great point, right? This idea, and this is for me as an outsider, but like kind of thinking about the undergraduate students, I think that spirit, the sense of like, cheering each other on is really something that pervades a lot of our undergrads and that they are really passionate about what they do and they are excited when people who are kind of also passionate about those same ideas or same subjects are doing some really amazing things. Um, and so I think if anything, a lot of our students are really just competitive with themselves. Like they expect a lot um, from, you know, their own efforts. And, and it's more that kind of energy as opposed to competing with others, um, if that's a fair statement or a fair observation. Um, but you, know, you also sort of mentioned working sort of with posse scholars. And I, I was thinking about this um, because a question came up in chat, you know, for you, and you're thinking about kind of the transition to college, particularly in this year, or with this upcoming cohort where um, it's going to look a little bit different, like, let's be honest, right, the, the college experience is going to be different than it has been traditionally for many years. Um, students are coming from a slightly different place. Um, could you speak a little bit about sort of the ways in which you've experienced or that you, you know of, um, of how Northwestern helps students make that first transition to uh, college outside of, of just peer advising or things like that? 
Yeah, I think outside peer advising, but also related to Wildcat Welcome, um, the name of these courses changes every two years or so. When I took them, they were TNDs or True Northwestern Dialogues. I think at some point they were ENUs, Essential Northwestern University. Um, but these are courses across um, hard to talk about subjects. So whether it's talking about um, um, sexuality or um, socioeconomic class, and you're with this cohort of 10 people who Honestly, you don't know before a week before this um, conversation has started, but you are given a brave space in which you're able to um, express your own experience and um, challenge um, other people's ideas and also have your ideas challenged while still knowing that you as a person is going to be valued in that space. Um, I think that that's something that's really great that is embedded just in Wildcat Welcome. And I'm kind of talking more as a Posse scholar, um, one of the big parts of um, the Posse program with Northwestern is the Posse Plus Retreat. And it's a retreat every April, uh, every year. And Posse scholars invite not only um, incoming students, but also staff members, faculty members, um, people from our counseling and psych psychological services. We're all united to talk about one issue. And so for this past year, the um, topic that we talked about was the state of the nation. And kind of in a similar way, students were united in a um, sense of camaraderie and also tenderness and being able to talk about these issues. I think if anything, Northwestern during my time here, I've realized that when I am most vulnerable, that is when my friends support me the most. And Northwestern has really allowed me the chance to express all of the aspects of my identity, my greatest joys and my greatest downfalls. And they, um, my friends at Northwestern, both faculty and um, peer wise have supported me along my, the entirety of my journey. Interesting. And so that actually leads me to another question that came up in chat. And um, feel free to let me know if you think this is too similar. But um, a student was very interested in sort of, let me actually read it so I get it right. Um, it says, Candace, what is the best non-academic lesson you've learned during your time at Northwestern? Um, I'm very curious to hear your take on that. And there's no, of course, right or wrong answer to that. Yeah, I think I was actually just writing this in a um, survey I was taking, but it came from actually um, the course I took, Building Loving and Lasting Relationships, Marriage 101. And the biggest thing that Dr. Solomon in that course um, emphasizes is that vulnerability is the key to connection. And when you're able to speak from your honest truth about the narratives that you are building into your brain or that the ones that you see unfolding, it's through speaking through honesty that um, I've found that I've been able to engage without feeling any sense of shame or resentment. And I think that that's something that I've experienced not only just individually through my Northwestern studies, but also just in interacting with people, as I mentioned before. Um, if, for, if you are a Northwestern student, that's because a group of people thought that you are an amazing person and we wanna have you on our campus and community. And so by being authentically yourself, that's how you're actually able to not only give the most um, back, but also receive the most. So definitely, that'll be my quote, vulnerability is the key to connection. That is fascinating. I'm always sort of just like curious. Like, I feel like I should take that class because everyone talks so much about it. Uh, <laughs> but speaking of your interaction with that professor, like, I, you know, when you, when you think about your entire Northwestern experience, like, how would you say, like, how accessible are the professors? Have they been easy to work with or to go to office hours or ask for help? Like, how does that play out for, I guess, how did that play out for you? Yeah, you're really great, Chris, in mentioning um, office hours. For every faculty member, they're required to have office hours in which they're meeting with students. So that's not for them to secretly have a phone call meeting during the time. It's just for them to have um, time to meet with students. And so you can use that. As I did um, this past winter, I was taking a early modern sexuality course um, in gender sexuality studies in the English department, and I was just really struggling. And I went to him and I said, hey, I don't know what's happening. Can you please help me? And he was able to engage my other interests and bring those to class. Or you could go to a class that you're really excelling in, like I mentioned before, my Cities and Society class with Dr. Patillo, um, just to figure out more what they're doing about um, outside of the classroom. The faculty members are very specialized. And what's great about that is that they love talking about the things that they've dedicated their lives to, which I would hope I would do want to do when I'm older as well. Um, and outside of that, I think faculty members are more than welcoming. If so even outside of um, office hours, I know one of my professors, Bill Savage, he would have office hours of Peckish Pig, which is over on Howard Street on the um, border between Evanston and Chicago. And he would just stay posted there on Wednesdays from roughly 3 p.m. until close. Um, so students could come um, grab a burger and talk to him or um, maybe talk about things in class too. That 
I mean, I laugh because like that's actually really close to like uh, one of my neighborhood hangout spots. Like that, they they have such a cool vibe in that place, and so I'm jealous that you guys actually got to like have office hours in there. And like, if you got to sit on the patio, that's fantastic. So. Ah, all kinds of good things with that. Um, but I think to underscore that point, like this is the story that I've heard from many um, students when they're talking about their professors, where I think a lot of times their professors say like, okay, you know, an exam is coming up. Let me kind of set up shop in a Starbucks for eight hours on a Saturday and just kind of hang out and um, be available to you that way. Or we've had students who said like, oh, I can't come to your office hours because I have lab you know, during that time and professors are like, okay, like, let's figure out a time that works for you, right? And um, I, I just sort of like love that they have that spirit where they want to engage with you as an undergraduate, like they get hired because they have to teach uh, in, in some ways. And so they are very kind of excited to work with you. They're not just interested in doing their research and doing their own thing, but they're, they, they want to engage with you as a student if you're interested in what they're doing. So um, I think that's kind of the the take home message for me from a lot of that. Um, but switching gears really quick and sort of to kind of bring us home, um, Candace, I'm, I, I'm curious because we're getting, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat um, to some degrees about kind of um, living on campus and the residence halls and that whole situation. Um, I know that we typically in the information sessions leave a lot of that to our tour guides, but since we're not going to have that today, um, would it be possible for you to kind of talk a little bit more? You mentioned Willard um, to talk about the different kind of options in terms of living facilities and sort of um, just your, your takeaway experiences of, of being in the residence halls on campus. Sure thing. So there are three different types of living uh, situations on campus. Uh, there are your most traditional kind of college um, residential buildings, and those are residential halls. Um, and you'll have all the kind of normal facilities, like I mentioned, dining hall, um, a study spaces, things like that. We also have residential communities, which tend to be on the larger side. And in addition to these normal facilities, we also have a live-in faculty member that lives inside these residential communities. So in Allison Hall, the um, live-in faculty members in the psychology department and she lives there with her dog. So if you like pets, that can also be another plus. And then um, on the more specialized end, we have our residential colleges and these are typically themed. Um, and so whether that's the, um, the Chapin Humanities uh, College, our International Studies Residential College, Communications Residential College. And for these, you don't have to be specializing in these studies in order to live there. You just have to fill out a short blurb of saying why you want to live in this community. And oftentimes you're able to live in them. And as I mentioned before, we have a two year on campus living requirement. If you choose to join a Greek organization and they have um, housing, you can live in Greek housing for your second year. And that counts as an on campus um, living um, or fulfills your on campus living requirement. Uh, to give you an idea of how accessible and um, approachable the Greek life here is on campus, um, there's 40% of students that are part of Greek life on campus and then also includes multicultural and pre-professional Greek organizations. But for me, as someone who is not a part of Greek life on campus, I lived in sorority row for two years. So it's very all ingrained and embedded all together. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's lots of different kinds of programming that each of these residential buildings do. So um, I know for my residential neighborhood, which that means is that, so I lived in Willard Residential College my first year. Willard um, Residential Hall had a dining hall in it. So anyone in my, or really anyone across the campus could come to that um, residential neighborhood, swipe in and use that dining hall. But Willard Residential Hall did not have a practice room. Um, I would be able to go over um, to South Mid Quads that had a practice room, swipe my um, wildcard ID to get inside the building and to use that practice room. So you're able to really foster a sense of community, not only just on your floor and in your building, which of course can naturally happen, but even across um, your residential neighborhood as well. Perfect. Um, and the last question that we have time for, unfortunately, we are up against the clock. Uh, uh, and I think Hillary's been doing a really great job in class, um, uh, in ter or not in class, in, in chat, <laughs> in terms of trying to field some of those questions and, and help us triage. But um, the question that seems to be really popular, and this happens every single time, uh, Candace, is uh, kind of learning more about uh, kind of how students ha have the ability to study business on campus, uh, knowing that we don't have an undergraduate business major. Um, I, I think we can probably drop the link to the Pathways to Business site and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, in your experience from an undergraduate and kind of working with friends, like um, what are the different routes or, or kind of how have students kind of uh, scratched that itch in terms of studying business? Definitely. So our most popular major at Northwestern is economics, and that is one way to possibly pursue business. There's also more specialized programs because the reason why we don't have a business major is because for lots of the top different business schools, they want um, students to, yes, know business tools, but have it be specialized to a certain subject. 
So whether um, at Northwestern you can pursue learning and organizational change, which is more kind of the um, startup culture um, in our School of Education and Social Policy, or being a communications major, because if you want to sell something, you have to be able to communicate the product you want to sell. Or maybe picking up an arts administration minor um, in the um, Bean School of Music. Um, there's lots of different types of very specialized programs which you're able to add it to add it to be your main concentration or an additional concentration. Another very popular one popular one is the Integrated Marketing and Communication Certificate in our Medill School of Journalism. But even outside of the classroom, say you have your main specialization, you're really set on that. Um, there's also our, um, we have a business fraternity on campus that you can have no matter what your major is. Um, my friend Adam, who was a bassoon performance major, was the president of our um, business fraternity during his time here. Um, he's now working at some very big banking company. I'm not once, I am math inclined, but not banking inclined. And now he's working at that company. Um, so I think if anything, Northwestern prepares you to be a well-rounded individual. So that way, when you come to that business table and you're there to talk about a product, you're not only going to be spewing out numbers or um, things like that. Perfect. Um, and yeah, and it, and if Hillary was able to post that link in chat, there's a lot of great information on uh, the Place the business site in terms of kind of finding out the different ways that students will accomplish some of that goals, anything from MMSS, uh, mathematical methods in the social sciences, to thinking about uh, kind of industrial engineering as a path that some students will take. So it's a really great starting point to sort of help understand how students at Northwestern might kind of achieve those goals, um, even though we don't have an undergraduate business degree. Um, but with that said, we are actually up against uh, the hour. And so I do want to thank Candace for taking the time. Uh, it's so fantastic to see you. I can't, I mean, I'm just like gushing. You are so, so lovely and wonderful. Um, and I think you see, gave some really good information. Um, before we close out, I just did want to kind of mention that we do have a lot of resources and upcoming things. Um, so if you want to learn more about our residence halls, there's some information on, online about that, some tours. Um, we have some upcoming information sessions, uh, virtual information sessions as well of different sorts. Uh, we have things for you to get in touch with current students, and that's all on our website. Um, so please check that out. Um, if you are kind of intrigued by what Northwestern might have to offer and you want a little bit uh, learn a little bit more. Um, we often have more targeted programming um, in terms of uh, kind of learning more about the campus environment, learning more about particular majors, about research, things like that. Um, and that's all either on our website or on YouTube. Um, and if you want to follow us, certainly this is kind of the official pitch. Uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram, uh, we have a lot of our current undergraduate students kind of posting stories about their lives um, and what's going on right now. So if you want to get a glimpse into sort of how that's playing out for a lot of our Northwestern students, um, they're uh, posting content to that channel as well. Um, but with that said, I do want to thank Hillary uh, for kind of taking the time and helping moderate chat. She's been doing really, really great work there. Um, but that is kind of all we have to uh, kind of mention this evening. If you do have additional questions, I know that unfortunately we weren't able to get to everything. Please feel free to contact our office. We are always there. We are working remotely, but are, we are still very available to you uh, through normal business hours. If you want to send us an email or give us a call, we're happy to answer those questions for you. Um, but with that said, I want to thank all of you for taking the time this evening um, or this afternoon to kind of chat with us. Um, and uh, it's really a case where, you know, again, I hope that you got some good information that you feel a little bit better about the process. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and sign off. So thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. All right. Bye.